now it's my pleasure to introduce to you a very familiar face, the chairman of the USGIF, the Honorable Jeff Harris. Uh, as our panel comes out here this morning, uh, we've had a great morning, and uh, we're now going to talk about sensing urban change from above. Uh, th I find this really exciting, um, and it's exciting because of sort of both the challenges and the opportunities. Uh, thanks to AGS for uh, two years running, put, putting together uh, a very important conversation. Uh, I think it's thoughtful. Um, I got to point out to Dr. Tucker, you hang around with a bunch of PhDs, and, and um, the PhDs, I think, have teed up sort of a very nice scientific perspective and a very nice social perspective. Our, our panel this morning is going to talk about the technology impact and the opportunity, and it's a little bit of science meets engineering. And, and, and so there are no really hard, distinct lines, but I think we have some practitioners and some experience base here that you'll find uh, very interesting. Uh, I think this will be the best panel of the conference, um, <laughs> because I currently have the microphone. And uh, I think this group will help us, uh, particularly with your Q&As, to help us get a systemic understanding of what we're talking about. Because we're in pretty much agreement about the observables, and now the question is, what are we going to do about it, and, and can the pocket, protead, uh, pocket protector brigade uh, sort of help us uh, with a systemic understanding of it? Um, it is really easy for all of us to talk about the speed of change. And what we really want to talk about is managing that change, uh, certainly when it comes around to uh, the megacities uh, and, and what happens. Uh, my hypothesis at the moment is we're going to see a big shift between the role of individuals and the role of governments. Uh, as we talked about this morning with Michael B Bloomberg pointing out that only 44% of the cities have a credit rating, uh, I think that um, governments will have trouble keeping up with the technology. And you know, sitting here at a university where that celebrates shared governance, uh, forming consensus in a shared governance model is really, 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 really hard. Empowered individuals with data is a very powerful force for change. And the intersection between those two things and the empowerment around decision making uh, will be interesting. Um, two organizations that I'm involved with, the United States Geospatial Intelligence Foundation and the Open Geospatial Consortium, um, we're proud to engage with AGS here at this conference. Uh, USGIF is an educational foundation that's focused on the development of tradecraft, and it's really the speed of that tradecraft uh, that I find so interesting and our ability to influence the young minds that will lead us to uh, 2050. Uh, the Open Geospatial Consortium is really about the speed to accurately align data. Uh, there's a standard that OGC uh, put out into the community called GeoProduct. And I was so pleased to see the speed of adoption where sort of the semantic nature of the data, the attributes of the data, and increasingly the providence of the data allow us to be either connected to a network or disconnected from a network and do sense making in real time when you're responding to a situation uh, like Sandy or uh, Isabel or uh, an earthquake. Um, as we move to the cities, we're going to see economic opportunity, but what I think is most interesting is economic disruption. Um, there will be challenges to business models. Uh, earlier this week, USGIF sponsored uh, really the major kickoff of a new working group that we have on spatial law and policy. And it's the opportunity for the engagement between the, the general councils and the practitioners of technology to go thing, get things uh, right about data, about software, about services. And what was really interesting from my perspective in that conversation, uh, lots of people are publishing data under common uh, license, 
but there's really no ability for the license provisions to evolve with the technology. And as a result, the lawyers are having trouble understanding when to say yes and when to say no, and the courts are starting to try and sort this out. And, and, and the judges are sort of saying, boy, I wish I had paid attention when I was in school, not to the legal framework, but how to think about this very disruptive uh, use of data. So as we move from selling of data to selling of services and uh, the proliferation of this, I think we will see some very exciting business models under new business constructs. And, and, and so the panel today will clearly celebrate things like City GML meets Sensor Web that provides the context for data uh, conflagration and, and uh, the speed at which we turn that into a useful app on the, on, on the phone is, is really exciting. Uh, if I put my university hat on, uh, I take note that uh, about a third of our incoming freshmen have tried to start a company by the time that they're a freshman. And, um, one of the measures that I have is sort of the juniors and rising seniors who are writing business plans as part of their courses are trying to convince their professors that it's a good business plan and they come back to campus you know, a handful of years later where the company's worth between $100 million and a billion um, and the professor trying to decide was that good advice but, but, but clearly the speed of how this change is taking place and, and the world is responding. If I look at emerging technologies, whether it be the air casting that we talked about yesterday or the one web that's providing or, or soon to provide a worldwide connectivity for communications, education, networks, and differentiated supply chain, you know, we see that the excitement in front of us over the next 30 years is nothing like sort of the last 30 years, and it's built on a foundation that many of us uh, helped to create. Again, as I look at new degree programs, uh, one that I'm familiar with, with a PhD in mathematical modeling, uh, is really about predictive analytics and uh, allowing us to take this increased understanding and do something with it. So the critical questions of what we know, what we do not know, and what do we think uh, happen at the, the, the speed of networks. And, and today we have a representative of data, we have a representative of systems, we have a representative of, of airborne, we have a representative of sort of the analyst and how analysts live in data, and we have a representative how, of how new forms of data and new software empowers analysts in order to get the, these insights that we all demand. Uh, so kicking us off this morning is Andrew Zoli, uh, who is now at Planet Labs, but has a rich experience of understanding the data demands uh, in order to go sort of drive new collections. So Andrew. Great. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeff, all I'd like to do is talk to you about expectation management uh, in saying this will be the rest panel. So I will just tell you that as, uh, this panel is going to get better and better and better and better. It's, a, it's an ascending curve to the other end of the, uh, to the, other end of the, uh, the chart there. So um, good morning. Uh, I, just by very quick introduction, I'm Andrew Zolli. I help oversee the humanitarian, social, environmental, what we call the impact portfolio of Planet Labs. Uh, Planet Labs was actually here at this meeting a year ago, and I think some of you had a chance to hear a little bit about them. Uh, so let me just say a word or two, and I'm going to, tr as a, I just want to say right at the beginning uh, two things. First of all, I am a recovering hyperbolic, uh, which means I will, I will try to not use words like awesome and amazing and incredible and extraordinary, especially extraordinary or anything like that. If you, if you find me doing it, you know, the first step is to admit you are powerless before your addiction. So I have to say it off the bat. The second thing uh, I want to talk to you about uh, is, is what we see at the, as the backdrop to everything I'm going to show you, which is that we live in a time of complex, interconnected, nonlinear, uh, systemic disruption in which the, the connections between systems are incredibly complicated, uh, non-obvious, sometimes obvious only in retrospect, uh, and uh, are connected in what you might call a giant hairball. And my advice to you is don't Google giant hairball. It cannot be unseen. Um, what I'd like to do is share with you just a little bit about what Planet is doing and a little bit about how we're thinking, given that we think a lot about systemic and social resilience and how those things usher forth from the, the many different dimensions of data and 
access to tools and engaged community action that are possible when, when the right people have them. So just by quick introduction, uh, what Planet Labs is doing is by the second half of 2016, uh, Planet Labs will be achieving its what we call mission one, which is to image the entire surface of the Earth every day at three to five meters per pixel resolution with near infrared, uh, and really with the mission to drive planetary stewardship, to, a, to attack uh, problems at global scale and uh, in areas where we have huge information gaps, and to make change on Earth visible, accessible, and actionable. And it has a tremendous range of applications, which I won't be able to talk about this morning, ranging from uh, monitoring the world's agricultural crops, looking at the pulsing change and dynamic change of urban cities, building uh, new kinds of financial products that allow us to hedge against emergent risks, uh, looking at new ways of thinking about forestry and infrastructure and governance, uh, et cetera. Uh, just to give you a sense of the kinds of things we're already doing uh, to advance thinking around that, we're working with the Rockefeller Foundation, USAID, a number of others, as part of something called the Global Resilience Partnership uh, to look at ways of using this kind of data to bolster the resilience of in initially three fragile regions of the world in the Sahel, in the Horn of Africa, and in Southeast Asia. Uh, we just announced uh, at the United Nations uh, when we were helping to launch the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data that Planet Labs will be making a $60 million contribution of open source data to create sandbox environments, what we call open regions, where we can create lots of experimentation and take the cost equation completely out because no one's had access to this kind of information before. In fact, we just announced that the first of those is actually the state of California. All of the observations that Planet has in its archive and is currently making about the state of California are now available for free for the next year. Uh, if you are interested, just go to planet.com and check it out. Uh, we will actually be announcing, we hope, it, sometime in the next quarter, I might add, just uh, the first truly uh, complete, I can't say much more about it this morning, but open country. We're working right now uh, to put together a partnership that will allow us to take an entire nation and make all of the geospatial data we collect about it and lots of other data sets open and available. Um, so we do a lot of work in seeing and, and sensing uh, urban change. Let me just give you a sense of the kinds of things that you can see. Here's a typical, uh, most recent image uh, of an urban landscape. I think this one happens to be Dallas. This was the most recent uh, digital imagery that we had uh, from space. Uh, Planet went by and uh, took uh, its, its own pass uh, over exactly the same scene and now has built automatic change detection and feature extraction tools that allow us to look at everywhere things have changed in that scene automatically, including uh, it was discovered an entirely new bridge uh, that didn't appear on any of the maps uh, that we had, that it was built very, very recently. So this idea of very high temporal, um, high cadence, high temporal resolution data uh, has potentially transformational impacts in understanding the way we think about uh, monitoring urban, urban change. I'll, I'll, we'll talk more about it, I hope, in the Q&A. But I wanted to give you sort of the converse example, if I could, and that's this one. Um, as we were learning to calibrate our imagery, uh, right at the very beginning, uh, we started to, and, and rectify it, north rectify it, et cetera. Um, we started to look at, at imagery, and this is a good example from Brazil, uh, and as we were overlapping our imagery. Now, you'll, under, you'll understand this is all very pre-product. We're literally like positioning the satellites and looking down. Someone said, um, what's missing there? Actually, what is, where did that go? Where did that whole space go? And it turned out after some digging, and, and I, you know, it was a fascinating email conversation as we began the process of actually trying to understand what had happened to an entire missing community. What had happened in an entire missing community is it had been bulldozed over by local authorities. And the opportunity to return that information for journalism, for activism, for government transparency and accountability, not to mention all of the infrastructural and kind of instrumentalist aspects of managing an urban system, we think are incredibly powerful and just as important as enabling the technocrats who manage the infrastructure and physical plant of a city is how we actually help people who live in them use this kind of data, which means we need to get very close to the communities that we, all of us, serve. 
Um, in closing, I'm just gonna, I could go through and give you lots of examples that look like that. So rather than do that, what I wanted to do is just give you a, a moment of speculation about the kinds of extraordinary things that might be coming. In order to do that, and I'll just mention that you can see all of these wonderful things that we actually have active threads, conversations, outreach, dialogues with scientists and geographers on all kinds of issues, including some of the ones that you see up here. Um, is our ability to take highly unconventional data sets and actually combine them. So very high cadence, for instance, social media data and very high cadence geospatial data and begin to look not just at how they correlate with each other, but how change in one domain presages or predicts change in another domain. And I'll give you just one example of this uh, work, that initial work that's coming from Facebook. Facebook has 1.55 billion monthly users around the world. It's the third largest social institution on Earth behind Christians and Muslims. There are more Facebook users than Catholics on the face of the Earth. So just let that drip the brains out of your ears for a minute. It's only been around for about a decade. Um, a group of researchers designed a group of emoticons. Have you all seen these things in your emails? Well, a group of social scientists designed a set that they rigorously cross-tested with cultures around the world to make sure that they all signified the same basic emotions and then used Facebook to distribute them to hundreds of millions of people. And then because they were on the other side of the interface, from the end users were able to see where in the world each of those emotions, independent of the linguistic specific context in which they were used, were used on a, on a, on a greater frequency and greater per capita. So for instance, here's a picture of where all the places in the world love is expressed differentially more using these tools. You could see places where uh, hate or ennui, for instance, ennui expressed dramatically through the Middle East. The Canadians and the Americans, very similar in their use of emotional states online and expression of emotional states online. The, um, Amer the Canadians expressed a great deal more sympathy than the Americans, that was one of the big distinctions, and the Americans a great deal more sadness, which we're still sort of figuring out. But what gets really interesting about this is when you can take this kind of particulate, uh, what we call kind of semantic analysis the contentful emotional resonance of this kind of social media and begin to overlay it on geospatial data and see where are the places on the world that freak people out, that upset them, that irk them, right, that concern them, and how then use tools that we can put in everybody's pocket to ask them why. Why is that place right there so unsettling to you? Or why is it in general so unsettling to so many people? Or why when people are close to it, do they express a certain kind of emotion? And how could we then take the way in which we analyze this daily cadence geospatial data and begin to predict places in the world that aren't working? And that's the kind of thing, the kind of project, the kind of geography that we're really excited to do that nobody has done before because we just never had access to those kinds of tools working together. And with that, I will say, great to be here. Thanks a lot. Omar uh, Balkasin uh, is the CEO of OG Systems. Um, I'm a big fan of Omar because he has a desire to address problems with a speed, efficiency, using a systems approach uh, that you don't find in big bureaucracies. Uh, and for over the last decade, uh, he has successfully done this with OG Systems. Uh, and he also contributes an awful lot uh, into helping to grow the next generation. So Omar, thanks for all your help with that. Jeff, thank you so much for the introduction. <clears throat> So a slightly little different approach. My, my partner and I literally started this business out of our garage, and we're over 350 people now. Agile integrators, agile systems and software integrators. So we looked at this a little bit differently and said, what does the state look like in 50 years? And, and we were trying to rewind, what, does, what, what did this forum look like in 1985 when the topic was geography 2015? Right? So it's kind of like, what does 30 years look like, or 50 years for 2050? 
And what does the state look like? And I'm thinking, you know, my kids are going to be 38, 39, and 40, and the, the velocity of innovation and technology that's happened in my lifetime, and just only uh, imagine, it's kind of mind-bending to see what they will experience. Um, you know, it, it's, it's one of these things where we believe uh, it's, it's really a technology evolution versus revolution in terms of remote sensing and all the sensors that are coming online and, and where we see the state of the market. You look back, if, you look, you know, if you're familiar with uh, Back to the Future, and hopefully everybody is, you know, last month was 30 years of evolution. We saw the introduction of the flat panel. We, f we saw the introduction of video conferencing and the famous, you know, you got fired, printed through the printer. Um, biometrics, when she got scanned, and she's like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you're 47 years old. How do you look like that? Right? Um, and, and then, but we, we still had this elusive hoverboard. Where is the hoverboard? Right? We're still looking for that, that thing. And, and that's where we think the, the, the state of remote sensing is going to be. I think we're pretty mature. I think um, there will be some nascent technologies that come online to help us do a lot of activity. But in terms of scalability and being adopted into the sea of data, um, it's going to be kind of on the exquisite scale. So from now into 2050, our thesis is we look at the integration and the software that will be available and, and what we believe um, we can create uh, uh, the, the, the integration of data. All right, so what are we, what are we talking about here? Right? We're talking, it's all about the data. And a lot of people here have talked about user-generated content. I think the, the UN you know, is projecting 10 billion or so people in 2050, and there were some great stats that came out of here, 70 75% of those folks are going to be in urban uh, environments, urban cities. So you're looking at about 7 to 7.5 seven billion sensors of which many of those people have, you know, you got your iPhone, you have your, your little, you know, your, your, your little mini drones. I mean, I, I probably have five or six sensors today. So you multiply that, it starts to be, you know, pretty mind-bending in the amount of sensors and collectors and opportunities out there to, uh, to collect data. So you got user submitted, user generated data coming off of every every platform there, and of course you have Planet Labs, and you have um, the Preds and the Reapers out there, and you have the lower altitude drones that you're seeing, DJI drones, and, and everything that's going to be available and more ubiquitous in, in 35 years, and it's going to be more common space. And of course you have um, the cloud, right? The cloud's going to be a little bit more easy to understand and use. We're gonna, we we believe it's one of those things where it's just kind of you know, storage on your device. It just goes up there and it's stored. And I'm not going to debate privacy, and we're just going to assume that all the data is tagged correctly, and, and we all accept that, or we don't. Um, but, but, but it's there. It's available on-demand use. So what, what are we saying here? It, you know, um, we, we look at it. It's data for use and consumption of, of all, all people, really. Uh, we liken it to that little uh, penny jar at 7-Eleven. You take some, you, you kind of, you know, you borrow some as you need it. And, and you push this into the cloud, and you have new business models that are going to be generated, you know, simply from guys and girls that are using their iPhone and maybe walking down the street and they're taking some great snaps, selfies, whatever it is, and maybe have some cool algorithms that kind of obfuscate your face. But it goes into the cloud, and, and you have other sensors that are collecting, and you have other people available to use that data to create a 3D model of their city, or, you know, I'm, I'm looking to move in a particular neighborhood. What's the floodplain analysis? Do you have, you know, what's the most recent type of uh, data sets I have? And, and, of course, we, we talked a lot about humanitarian, humanitarian efforts, you know, having that kind of sensor and data availability on demand. Uh, we talked about emergency preparedness. I mean, all of these things that can, you know, require personal sensors to do all this stuff. Um, you know, risk analysis, um, social use, of course. I mean, there's, you know, crime use, you know, just personal use that you would, you would have the ability to do. Um, so we, we look at, you know, bringing all this disorganized data and organize it with... Um, there's a chaotic amount of technology out there. Now you got NVIDIA and their GPU processing, and you have Google and their TensorFlow and their, you know, their open source AI. We're going to see more of this. And so how do you take all this disorganized technology and organize it against disorganized data? And, you, and the idea that we believe is going to be software for velocity, speed, and accuracy. Right? Getting all this data in an accurate, fast, consumable form is where, we're, where we are kind of putting our, our thesis in. Um, then you get patterns of life, right? You get, you know, just lots of open source activities out there. I mean, everybody's going to be applying open source uh, collection techniques and, and using that and the power of the technology in the cloud. All right, so what do we got? Okay, so the data mart, right? That's not necessarily anything new in its current physical state, but we look at on demand, right? Everybody has this DVR remote and you have this on demand. You know what you like, you know what you don't like. You're able to profile certain things. Um, you know, so that's where we're, we're, we're looking for coordinated, you know, conditioned, purposeful data. 
uh, timely and relevant. I mean, these are the things that, that mission planners need. This is the things that uh, humanitarian aid needs. This is, the, this is what, you know, the, the good guy needs, right? This is, you know, we heard Sue Gordon talk this morning. This is what the FBI needs. This is what the agency needs. But you also have just the fun guy, right? I mean, what's that cool bar down the street that has, you know, ESPN playing the Super Bowl? And what's the weather look like? And what does the waste traffic look like? Can I get inside and out of that? What are some of the latest pictures? Is there really a good crowd to go hang out with? Or the opposite of that, I don't want to deal with any of that. I want to go to the bar down the street and hang out and, and enjoy a quiet beverage. And then, of course, you also have the bad guy. The bad guy is going to have access to this exact same data. So how do we you know, get around the fact that the data is going to be open, it's going to be available, uh, and it's going to be used for different um, purposes, as we saw last Friday in, in, uh, for, in France? OK, so this is what we are setting our thesis against. And we're you know, trying to figure out what does this mean. It's kind of our you know, Netflix dashboard. This is where you have all your inputs. You, you, you create your user profiles. Uh, my my five-year-old, when I play him in Wii, he's like, Dad, I got to make my profile. I want to be eight feet tall, 300 pounds, spiky hair. I'm like, why? He's like, because I have to beat you at everything. So I think that that profile will allow me to do that. So you set these profiles up based on what you're trying to beat in terms of data knowledge, data consumption, and figure out what you're trying to do. You know, you, you connect up to your Facebook, your Yelp, your Waze traffic, your, your particular feeds that you're interested in. Uh, imagery, you know, it could be LiDAR, it could be HSI, it could be any of the phenomenologies and sensors that are out there today. But the idea is coordinate it, condition it, and make it human consumable. Um, just like we have on our DVR. Hit play, forward, rewind. Um, we, chart to, we start to see things that are trending. You know, we want to know what happens today. Sue so talks about what we want to find out what's happening tomorrow and next month. Right? This is the kind of stuff that we're talking about. The data is out there. How do we get smarter technology integration going and soft, smart software so our analysts understand that it really is three easy buttons that I'm trying to, to, to apply? And again, you could use that in your personal life, but you know, particularly where we support, it's, it's the intelligence community and how do we really help prevent um, a disaster of, of, of um, cataclysmic activity. So this is where we believe. It's on-demand data. Press a button, you get it going. All right, so this is how we, we kind of set the stage, right? I mean, that's the power of the data. Again, we have the good guys, the fun guys, and the bad guys, and they're all going to be consumers of this data. Uh, how do we step ahead of the bad guys and be you know, two or three miles ahead of them? But the data, I mean, at the end of the day, the data came, the data saw, and the data conquered. Right? And so how do we harness all of that information in a consumable form? Um, and again, I had the pleasure of, of, of um, listening to Sue talk earlier this week at the small sat, and, then, and today. It's, it's, it's time, right? We need to stop talking about this and start actually doing it, and, and that's what my company is actively involved in. Uh, we can't wait 35 years for this. I think we need to make incremental improvements, and uh, that's where we are, and that's how we're going to uh, provide you in the palm of your hands to make uh, timely, relevant decisions. So thanks. Appreciate the time. Chris, appreciate the invite to talk here. Um, I'm looking forward to the next one. Yeah. Omar, thank you. Um, Brian Fulmer uh, joins us as a vice president of Lido's uh, NEE SAIC. Um, but Brian was sort of interesting because he noticed that the world was actually not two dimensional. A, it wasn't flat, and B, it wasn't two dimensional. And he went off to the US Army in a program called Buckeye and had to convince them that. Um, Terrain relief matters, and you'd think if you had a 60-pound back on your a pound back, a pound pack on your back, you would understand that terrain matters. Uh, but the success of the Buckeye program, Brian, and your efforts on that, uh, I think, uh, allows you to say, what's it like when you know new data sets have to be introduced, and what's it like when uh, technology meets bureaucracy? So, Brian, please, thank you for joining us. Absolutely, thank you. <clears throat> First of all, thank you for uh, AGS for putting this on and uh, letting me be part of it. Um, yesterday morning when I was sitting in here, uh, Lee Schwartz stood up, stood up after one of, the, one of the panels and he challenged the panelists to think like it's 2050. And it kind of made me rethink the presentation, rethink what, what we wanted to talk about and how do you really, how do you take that journey as it, as it stated to get to 2050 and look at what, what things may be like or what the art of the possible is in 2050. I think the first thing that we have to do is kind of uh, look back and see how far we've gotten. Uh, you know, as, as Jeff pointed out with the Buckeye program, I look at back over the last 10 years and how far we've come along with that. And it made me think actually of a slide uh, 
speaking of the, the difference, there's a, a common slide we've used for a long, long time to explain the need for high resolution terrain data. And it just, this, say 10 years ago, is what was available, and this is what's provided today. So you think about that over the last 10 years, and then advance that for the next 35 years, and where are we gonna be with resolution, with speed of collection, with the, uh, the, the pure data that we're gonna pull out of these sensors and the remote sensing from above. Um, just to go back to that one again, if I can. It's just the, the start difference. And the thing is, nothing in this scene changed between these two data sets. It's just the resolution of the data set and what we're able to collect with it. <clears throat> So the collecting LIDAR and going out, collecting basically any geospatial data, but for, this, for the purpose of this one, specifically LIDAR, when you go out, in my case, talk to combatant commanders, you talk to uh, civil affairs teams, things like that, the common questions that are always going to come up is how high can the resolution be, how fast can you collect it, how much of it can you collect that fast, and how long until I have the data in front of me. And those are the things that we've struggled with and advanced on on the Buckeye program over the last few years and the, the ability to push that forward. You've got to answer all of those questions, and those questions are never going to change regardless of how fast we do it, how much, how high the resolution is. It's always going to be the same question, and you're always going to be striving for the next one. So, again, just leading into that, what is the art of the possible by 2050 is, what, is one of the big questions there. Um, So in thinking through that, I went and looked just at the example of today and what we can do today for a, a space like New York City. If you want the, you know, the highest data, the, not the highest, but a, you know, the, the common sense highest, if you will, resolution data, it's going to take you 44 hours to collect that using the standard sensors. Now, that number is going to fluctuate depending upon which sensor you use. There, there are plenty of different ones, and I'm speaking specifically to LIDAR for this as well. Um, but on the, on the average, it's going to be somewhere in that realm to get that, that quarter meter data that you really need to sense change and, and uh, identify change in the urban environments. What we're seeing now is an advancement in the sensors and what we believe is going to be coming available in the next uh, months, I'd say six months to, to a year. We're going to be able to do that in about a third of the time. And that's just, again, I want to go back to it. That's just the advancement over the last five years and where we've been able to get to. And again, there, the, those numbers are going to fluctuate a little bit depending upon what sensor you talk about. There are a lot of sensors that are, that are coming out. But when you take that into consideration, that was 10 years. We're doing it in a third of the time for the over, just under a third of the time that you would do it for the, the technology that's not even old yet. Um, so when you look at that for the next 35 years, what, uh, what, how much advancement can we make in, in that time as well? <clears throat> Which leads to the last one, what is capable in 2050? And, and again, I attack this purely as a, uh, a question of LIDAR. I don't see any reason with LIDAR why in, in 2050, 35 years from now, we can't sense the city in a, a fraction of a day and revisit it every day and detect the change from day to day. Um, it's, gonna con it's gonna require that we continue to drive the requirements and we continue to, to uh, push all the vendors, push the, the folks like myself and everybody else on the panel and the companies that we represent to be able to, to get to that point. But I don't see any reason why we can't get there and be able to provide a, a fidelity of data that's phenomenal, really, and be able to handle the data at the same time. So, thank you. Brian, thank you. Uh, Laurie Jordan is an amazing person because he has the patience of Job. Um, he, he understood uh, decades ago that analysts that were swimming in the pool of data could get help um, from things that we now take for granted with displays interact, data displays interacting with retinas and brains. 
Um, and he sat with these analysts to try and convince them to give up their shoeboxes of data and their vellums with grease pencils um, and said that there was something like a pull-down menu that could actually give them access to data. Uh, and he stuck with it. And, and, and today, um, he gets to tell on a daily basis uh, Jack Dangerman at ESRI how to think about uh, the interaction with people at the, in order to make the understanding. So we've taken probably the, one of the smartest guys about understanding how people think about interacting with data uh, with one of the forces of nature in the form of Jack Dangerman, who's trying to take all this technology and, make it, and expose it. So Laurie, thank you for joining us. Great, thanks, Tim. Great. Thank you. That was great. Thanks, Jeff, and good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be with you, and it's great to see so many longtime good friends. Um, I have to uh, start out with a quick confession. Uh, I'm not a geographer. I'm a landscape architect by training and inclination, and very happily so. And we're in a lightning round, and this lightning round, Jeff, has given us five minutes. Well, as you can probably tell, uh, I'm from the South. <laughs> I'm a little bit slow. Usually, you don't find me and lightning in the same sentence. <laughs> But nonetheless, um, I'm going to go through these slides pretty quickly, and I made a copy for you, and I've given it to Jeff. So we'll just kind of just jump right into this. So we all have one thing in common this morning, and that is something that we know and love, which is geography. It's an integrating science of our world that gives us a context and the content that shapes everything around us every day of our, our modern lives. We're all sitting in a front row seat about to witness, we are witnessing, uh, in entering a new period of what we think of as geographic enlightenment. There is a true awakening of global society to the power of geography. And GIS is one of the central actors in this movie. It is the platform that is being used to apply geography literally everywhere at every level. And why this makes sense is that GIS is not only a framework, but it also provides the processes to enable this end-to-end sequence of events that allows us to make decisions and take action. It starts with not only capturing the raw information and the content from our observations and from our sensors, but allows us to do the analytics, leads us into predictions, allows us to create from that designs, develop designs, build and implement these designs, make decisions from that, and, and literally take action. So it's a very well-fitted, well-optimized uh, environment to make decisions to make the world a different and hopefully a better place. It's actually becoming a type of critical infrastructure in and of itself. So as information technology is dramatically accelerating, we're seeing this in mobile devices, in crowdsourcing, social media, cloud computing, at every different level, at every different scale. That technology has actually had a, an amazing and, and, and remarkable uh, effect on GIS technology itself. It's actually changing, probably in, in my opinion, for the first time in the 50 year history of modern GIS, the architecture of GIS itself is changing into an entirely new pattern. And this is something that uh, we call web GIS. This WebGIS is really a transformational architecture, and if you look at the left side of this, the old way that things were done, and I, I'm gonna see if I can point to it with a laser pointer, but you can tell they've made this pointer just for me. They put a little label on it that says, Laurie, do not peer into laser with remaining eye. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if you can see, <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> I don't know if you can see this, but, um, in the past, uh, really for the first 50 years, uh, GIS systems required you to download data and its metadata into a central geo database. It was pretty static, and you'd make operations on that. And it was really what we could think of as a system of record. The evolution going forward in this web GIS pattern is an entirely new pattern where the center of gravity is replaced. It's no longer a geo database, but it's a geo information model. It's essentially a, a new heart that connects the central nervous system of GIS, and it connects to a whole different set of things that are not static, but they're actually dynamic. And what this does is it moves GIS technology from a system of record to what we think of as a system of engagement. If we open the curtain a little bit and took a little closer look at the inside of this, uh, this, this new heart, the arteries that feed it are actually live dynamic services. These are mapping and image services. 
These are streams of data coming in from live sensors of every type, of every scale, from every different direction. The way I think of this is this is the, I'm gonna call it the geospatial blueprint for harnessing the power of the internet of things. Everything has a sensor now. We have citizens as sensors, soldiers as sensors, cars, refrigerators, thermostats, imager systems. These are all the feeds that are coming in uh, into this new paradigm, this entirely new model that we call WebGIS. Uh, here are all the taxi cabs in New York City, uh, millions of events. Uh, there's transactional processing and parallelized processing on the fly, so meaningful information can be streamed directly into this WebGIS pattern so that decisions can be made essentially in near real time. And this is my favorite uh, imagery. It's, it's what I love the most and I get to play with a lot at work. Um, uh, another confession to make, um, in, in grade school, I was the eighth grade spelling bee champion, okay? So the nuns, if they were here today, would have a heart attack if they heard me tell you this morning that the word geography starts with an I. It's called imagery. Imagery is where geography comes from. It is the G in GIS. Now my, my, my colleagues at work in, in Redland squirm a little bit when I poke at them, a little fun at them, and say, you know, imagery is not just nice to have, it's the foundation of GIS. That's where all the foundation layers come from. Terrain, elevation, roads, buildings, surface features, water, lakes, rivers, even subsurface features, geology and soil, that are either directly or indirectly inferred from imagery. So it's not just uh, nice to have, it's the foundation. So they're squirming a little bit, and then I tell them it's, it's even more than that. It's becoming the new face of GIS. You know, it's, it's, the map of the future is no longer a 2D vector, one to 24,000 topo map. It's a photorealistic 3D image that I can fly through, interrogate, analyze, and get meaningful information, and it's becoming a wearable appliance. It's the next phase of the Apple Watch. And so you saw the other panelists this morning, beautiful presentations on where this dream, this vision is actually coming to life. So I, for one, couldn't be more excited, and this is a, this is a very important trend. So Jeff charged us to look at uh, sensing uh, urban change from above, what I'd like to do is take a quick moment and change our optics and change our look angle and look at it from within. How is GIS changing urban organizations from within? And this is one of the most transformational parts of all, which I think is very interesting. Traditionally, uh, organizations uh, within uh, cities uh, have what you could think of as a stovepipe architecture. They're, multiple redundant organizations at the bottom level, oftentimes collecting information redundantly with gaps, it's imperfect. It gets filtered up through these stovepipes to decision makers and it's often very imperfect data resulting in not, not optimized decisions. The central geoinformation model changes all of that. It becomes distributed, shareable information where every part of the organization is operating on a common geographic understanding. That's the real transformation. So it's not just changing internal organizations, it's cross-cutting across organizations. So here, this, and this is a real world example, the city of Los Angeles, I think the second largest city in the United States, the mayor said, I wanna take all this investment that I made in open data, and I wanna expand it, I want open services, I want an open platform, and I wanna share this, not only with the utilities, but also startup companies, citizens, nonprofits, I want to share it with everyone. And so they're actually doing this. So this GIS transformation, this web GIS pattern, is actually enabling uh, a whole new level of uh, collaboration across organizations. And the way that we interact with it is no longer difficult, complicated, have to be a programmer. Uh, it's increasingly something that we all know and love, which are apps. Uh, these are light, simple, quick, and very easy to use. Uh, whether you are dealing with uh, mobile field workers, uh, internal office, or even the citizens at large with this new thing uh, called story maps, which have really gone viral and, and people love them. So I sometimes have a challenge with some of our engineers when they, they say, well, you know, what do you mean make everything simple and quick? You know, uh, we love the, how advanced it is. Isn't it neat to have all these complicated options? And I say, no, no, it's exactly the opposite. So I got through to them by giving them an example of a car navigation system. 
it's what I call the illusion of simplicity. So we all have a navigation system in our car, in our phone. Uh, it knows where we are. We give it an address, and it just takes us there. If we get lost or we don't follow the directions, it'll growl, bark at you for a minute, recalculate, and it'll just take you there. It's remarkably simple. It's elegantly simple. But what you don't see, and what's really remarkable, is that four of the technologies that make that happen are the most complicated technologies ever invented in history. You have a constellation of a few dozen satellites on orbit several thousand miles up. They're triangulating with each other a thousand times a second. It's a glorious clock. They're actually communicating with your car through the atmosphere, which is an enormous physics problem by itself. The satellites are moving, the Earth is turning, and your car is moving at a variable rate of speed across a topologically structured vector network with a database of attributes, fire stations, restaurants, uh, police, and so forth. And then there are these advanced routing algorithms. Do you want to go the fastest way or the shortest way? But luckily, we're not confronted or have to wrestle with any of that. It just works. So it's what I call the illusion of simplicity. It actually makes complicated things simple. And this is a challenge, and that's the opportunity, and that's the example. It's absolutely doable. I think we're going to see more and more of this as technology advances. It'll become simpler and more pervasive. And lastly, and I'll wrap up here, I know I'm going a little bit long, uh, a fundamental underpinning of all this is openness. And that's why we're very fortunate uh, at ESRI to be one of the original and uh, principal members of OGC. We strongly support OGC and openness at, at every level. I think we're one of the, I was talking with my friend George Percival the other night, I think we're one of the largest contributors to uh, the OGC community in terms of libraries, uh, APIs, uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, contributions to the GitHub, and we actually use it as well in our own software. It's fundamental, and to us, the definition of it is, is more than just open data. It's supporting and helping co-evolve new open standards. It's open format, and it's an open platform. It's not only open, but interoperable. It's interoperable with other commercial packages. It's interoperable with open source things, and uh, it allows people to integrate with it and extend its architecture to make users successful, which is ultimately what that's all about. So I'd like to conclude by just saying that we're at the most exciting time. We're witnessing an entirely new era. We like to say that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And that's what we're saying right now, a reinvention of geography. So thank you. Laurie, thank you. Uh, Brian with an I talked about uh, uh, 3D. Uh, Brian with a Y, Brian Lane of Pixia. Um, Brian and, and Pixia figured out that there was a time component to this story and that much like Laurie had to tell the analysts uh, uh, to move into soft copy to get to the richness of the data, uh, Pixia has done an awful lot to help us understand the richness, richness of understanding uh, moving pictures uh, and, and the power of that for understanding time. Um, uh, a shout out to Pixia, they took their whammy format and, and brought it in through the OGC process uh, that allowed it to scale very quickly. Uh, so Brian Lane, uh, we appreciate uh, the efforts that you've done on behalf of the community and yeah. the stage is yours. Thank Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, good morning everybody, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, Actually, before I move on to the next slide, I want to tell an anecdote from last night. Somebody had asked me, uh, Brian, so what, what do you do for fun? Uh, and I responded, in my spare time, I'm a professional cage fighter. Um, <laughs> and that got kind of a, an, a, an interesting response. And so that'll add a little bit of context to my next slide. Um, what I would like to talk about today is uh, some of my past experience kind of my assessment of where I think where we're at in the present and what I think kind of my expectations are for the future. And so uh, <laughs> the, these are two of my Nepalese friends uh, that I held focus mitts for when I was in Afghanistan the second time. And what you can't see from this picture is literally a few weeks before that, these guys were engaged in close quarters combat um, when some attackers had breached the wall and they holed up in a warehouse while they rained machine gun fire down on the, the people that were inside. And so the ending of this story involves these guys, 
who are very near and dear friends of mine from the Marines and the Air Force. And they coordinated, they left their hardened position on the base, and they coordinated with a drone overhead and through a remote terminal, guided security forces to secure the compound. Um, that's where we're at today with technology that we have. I know the military is an early adopter of technology, and it's only a matter of time before uh, systems like this will make, it, make its way off of the battlefield and into applications that make society better as a whole. And so let's talk about some other systems that we have in the present. We'll start with one that we should all be very familiar with. Um, I, I'll just say the, the Washington, D.C. Department of Motor Vehicles is very familiar with who I am. In fact, I'm pretty sure they hunt me on a regular basis whenever I drive into the city. And they didn't know your bank. And they didn't know my bank. Um, and, uh, and so we have a system in place now that captures how fast I'm driving, uh, reads my license plate automatically, references a database, and sends me a ticket in the mail whether or not I'm even driving. Uh, to take that one step further, we literally have capabilities today where we can select an object of interest in pixels or photos and videos and search through a massive archive and identify where that object occurs in relative space and time. And then everybody loves cake, right? And we all know that the more layers a cake has, the better it is. And the same thing applies with data. So today, we're literally merging uh, signatures from lasers, from LIDAR, like was talked about earlier, uh, from hyperspectral imagery, from uh, sonar and radar to create these analytic cookbooks to define how the environment changes around us. And then, of course, we have our wide area motion imagery capability, where we can literally uh, provide persistent, high resolution coverage of an area two times the size of Atlantic City. Refresh that in real time. We can pause, play back, fast forward, rewind, and that's archived in a searchable database. And today, just for one of our customers, we've processed over 15 petabytes of data, uh, served that up to users worldwide, and that 15 petabytes is larger than the 250 billion photos uploaded to Facebook today. And so here's what that capability looks like in action, right? And so we start zoomed out of the entire coverage area. We zoom in and we can see cars zipping around uh, along the streets. We can automatically track those cars and count, let's say, how many times, uh, 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 how many vehicles cross an intersection. And at, actually, in thinking about the future, I was really intrigued by the urban sensor web panel yesterday, and I would love to see integrated city sensors on an overlay just like this. And so let's talk a little bit about the future, right? That's a, that's a really strong understanding of where we are in the present. We have this capability today to provide that huge coverage area. I don't exactly know the details of what the future will hold, but I do have some expectations, and a lot of these have been talked about already. The first one is autonomy, right? A lot of the routine functions in our life will become set it and forget it, just like the old infomercial. Um, whether it's operating a vehicle, whether it's going grocery shopping, managing the power grid, or doing routine maintenance, those things are, are gonna be routine, automatically recurring, and only adjusted when needed. And then we have this blanket of persistence from terrestrial, aerial, and celestial sensors covering our world in, three, uh, in 3D, such to the extent that it would even make hipster Eye of Sauron a little jealous. I don't know if there's any <laughs> Lord of the Rings fans out there. Um, and then, of course, resolution, right? Our sensors become more precise. Our photo and video analytics capabilities uh, become better. And so that entails kind of a shift in policies and regulations on how we view privacy. Our data points will become more granular as we become better at mapping people to places and events. What we sacrifice in that privacy, though, we gain in precision. So you'll never have to sit in a traffic jam ever again. That won't matter because you won't be driving your own car anyways. Um, data collection and logistics services will be done by drones from resources that are shared on demand. So in thinking about these problems, there's a number of challenges to get from here to there. There's two, as a product owner, I'm very specifically focused on. 
Uh, the first one is data management. How do, we, um, how do we collect and organize all of that data to make it accessible for users? And then the second component is kind of my analyst hat speaking. Um, how, how do we understand new data sets as they come online? And how does that fit into the analytic cookbooks that we have today to solve, to solve whatever our analytical problems are? And so I actually, I have something to ask of you. I know there's this inherent tension uh, between the rigor of science and the speed of entrepreneurship. And so what I would ask you, the scientists, the engineers, the geographers, to become tinkerers, to, um, to partner with technological alchemists, to stretch the limits of your respective disciplines, I would ask you to stay true to the science, but to embrace the application and create our future. Thanks. Uh, Brian, thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew, Omar, Brian, Laurie, and Brian, uh, for your lightning talks that allow us uh, 18 minutes now to do Q&A uh, with you. Um, so uh, please, let's, let's make this a conversation. Um, as we talked up here, I was reminded as sort of a, a strangely pivotal moment for me where I was sucked into a conversation in Chicago one day where I was moderating a panel uh, in front of an audience of journalists and generals, uh, journalists with a J, generals with a G, and, and we were talking about the influence of technology on their lives. And it was interesting because journalists and generals don't actually get to have the conversation all the time, but what we were showing was how data changes both of their lives so quickly. And the example that I used was we talked about the one bad guy that needed to be eliminated, and we created a video of the bad guy being eliminated and slid it under the door of a journalist and said, if you got this video under your hotel room in Sarajevo, um, would you run with the story? And they said, well, if I had a video source, of course I would. And, and um, so then I showed the video that was uh, clearly doctored via the ability of digital technology. And he says, well, maybe I should have second sourced that. Uh, and, and so in this sea of data, uh, we will have the ability to answer a lot of those questions uh, in, in real time. But, but what the generals recognized was that the chain of command falls apart so quickly. Uh, and, and so it's no longer your mother's Oldsmobile uh, in um, how you think about a problem, nor is it your mother's Oldsmobile uh, as to how the time and speed that you react to it. Uh, so as we get the, the audience warmed up, um, is, there, uh, is there a bright future here with this collision between sort of culture and technology and organization and technology? Mr. Integrator, Omar? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I believe that that's, <clears throat> you know, the, the nature of the beast, right? I mean, you have so many inputs coming in. How do you really resolve that quick, fast, and actionable? I think it's almost so, so complicated. You almost don't know what to do with it. How do you make exquisite things that are relevant to your day-to-day -day activities? And the GPS example is actually a great example of that. You don't even think about it. You just say, send me to this place, and you don't realize all the things that are happening there. And, it, and again, it really is, um, for me, and I think the thesis of, of how our organization thinks that technology is going to mature, right? That's, that's unknown, but how do you really resolve data fast? And I think that's where you're going to see some of these exquisite technologies. Pixie, a great example, you know, um, pr providing that platform for the analytical uh, separation of all that noise into signals that you could actually consume, uh, you know, from a, just a human consumable perspective, yeah. So, so Laurie, you, you talked about how you're exposing data in a GIS system. If I get to 2050, uh, this isn't a business question, this is a culture question still. Uh, have I gotten, re uh, gotten away from government-led GIS organizations because the services that Omar just spoke to are being provisioned by this collection of open data and provided service? And uh, I'm not, it's not a business uh, question, it's again to this culture that I'm living in this data. I, I liked your comment about simplicity. Um, does it change the way we organize? I think it has profound implications on it. I think uh, the majority of us don't have an S&T background. Well, in this room we do, but society doesn't. But as this thing goes global and it goes societal, 
I think there's, a, there's an assumption, a new normal, a new expectation that it's going to be, it's just going to work easily, quickly and easily, and it's going to be right. So actually that creates a, a higher level of responsibility for us to do the work behind the scenes to make sure that what rolls out that's quick and simple is actually also right. And I think that that's probably uh, one of the most important challenges for us, and that's why I think it's a role that AGS could absolutely play uh, in the future. Making the lines between government and commercial disappear, between science and citizens disappear, uh, but nonetheless, there will not be any diminishment in the human nature of wanting instant gratification. Simple and quick. I mean, every kid that plays video games, and I don't, I don't play video games, but every kid that plays video games knows the quickest way to get killed in a video game is to move slowly or stand still. <laughs> so we're actually in a real life video game with uh, this industry, this profession. So speed will always be with us and accelerates. We just have to get it right. So you raise your hand so the mic can head uh, your direction. And uh, while the mic is heading your direction, somebody raise your hand so I can see a mic moving uh, with the question. There we go. And then Andrew, while the mic's moving, uh, you talked about rich data sets that you're giving away in order to go create demand. Uh, how do I create money for innovation uh, in this giveaway marketplace? Do the business models uh, scale to the excitement of free data? <laughs> Well, I think it's a couple of things. Let me just sort of start. To answer that question, a couple of observations about the conversation thus far. Um, <clears throat> first of all, uh, we face in this century uh, planetary scale challenges. And we uh, will not solve them, I guarantee you, or even make meaningful progress on them if we are not creating a participation revolution. And you know, in the, we spend a lot of time talking about big data. Well, if information is power and data is the key ingredient in information, then I think by the transitive property, big data is big power. And the ability to put very powerful tools in the hands of elites is terrific. But it may amplify power imbalances and actually suppress that sort of inclusive and participatory structure that we need to make meaningful real progress at the smallest scale of our lived experiences, to understand ourselves in context in this century of really disruptive change. So I think that's uh, essential. Uh, it's not about just creating demand. It's also about just incubating uh, both a participation revolution and an understanding that we don't precisely know what 2050, we don't frankly quite know what 2020, 2030. I mean, I, <clears throat> I saw two pictures recently, uh, a, just a picture of the, uh, the moment when Pope Benedict was announced at the Vatican and everyone's clapping. And then a picture of exactly the same scene of uh, Pope Francis being announced and everyone holding up their phone. And it was a sea of phones. There were seven years between those two events, seven years. And halfway between them, the iPhone arrived and changed dramatically. So it's very, very hard to predict. I think we have to create room in our conversation for the concept of emergence that we don't actually know. Some of these solutions are going to only occur when we get a large participatory wave. And that's actually why we're doing that. We're doing that because we genuinely believe that this is an essential thing to creating real planetary stewardship and innovation, and that the best innovations are going to be designed with, not for. And I, I really so think So then that, the business will follow. And the business will follow. Okay. You know, the solutions come on the back of that. Question. Yes, um, going off of what you just said, uh, how do we increase participatory planning um, or participatory GIS to improve society for the better good? So just going off like the speaker's um, presentation about military drones, um, how do we improve military drones so that innocent people are not killed on the receiving end? Like there's lots of talk about how, you know, we were going after this militant and 20 other people got killed, you know, or the fact that um, Doctors Without Borders is being bombed. Like, how do we prevent that? And exactly what you said, like, how do we prevent the government from having too much power to, like, implement those strategies? Yeah, um, that's, that's a great question. Um, 
and at the end of the day, really, it comes down to precision of data, right? And so I had a conversation yesterday uh, with, with a number of you out here, and I asked the question, how precise is precise enough? And the answer, of course, is it depends, right? It depends on what you're trying to do. And so the, the continual march towards more and more and more precise data sets and being able to empower the end user to have access to whatever level of accuracy they need in order to complete their mission. So I think that will always be ongoing. Precision is, is something that's always very important. Next question. Good morning. Uh, so I was taught as an undergraduate uh, that uh, when you're trying to make decisions, you want to combine science, praxis, and ethics. Right? The science gives you the knowledge, the practice. You start thinking about how can you apply the knowledge. But then ethics. What's right or wrong about that application? And the, uh, the general uh, trend is to build business models associated with individual preference. All right, that's what drives, we heard it from you, uh, all of you. So where's the feedback in ethics if the driving force of the social construct is preference? The, the question is, is there, you know, I, I give a talk every, every year, and sort of the, the last chart of the chart chart is based on the availability of location-based information. At the end of the talk, I say, how many people are creeped out by this? And the, the New York Times article says, if you're born before 1984, you are creeped out. If you're born after 1984, <laughs> you're not creeped out. <laughs> and, and it's just sort of, a, 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 from a data scientist perspective, a, a clear uh, digital divide uh, based on age group for opting in based on sort of your preference question. Um, then I take it and it says, we all go watch uh, the TV show 21, and we love it how a female analyst in the speed of time can harness the sensors, all that we talked about, so that we differentiate the guy with the bomb and the guy with the dynamite uh, from, from Omar's, and we think that's good. Now, when I speak as a former director of a, of, a, of a national intelligence agency, I always sort of get the question, what is our capability how does our capability as a country compare with that of the capability of Hollywood? Uh, and, and, and that almost gets to the, the orthogonal to your question about what, what the preference is. It depends what problem, what problem you're solving. So the precision that Brian just spoke to for feeding the nine billion people on the planet, where we're doing precision agriculture using GPS at the plant level, and we're understanding farm to table in order to reduce the carbon footprint with the ease of simplicity that Laurie spoke to, is all these preferences aligning in a marketplace that is a conversation Andrew and I were trying to have. Mm. And then all of a sudden, I give you four examples, and maybe we do this, Chris, next year, is, is we'll get the little smartphone uh, app that says we'll give you four examples and, and, and vote on which of the use of this technology fits our current preference scheme. And if you'd asked me 20 years ago, uh, as a baby boomer, do I desire to live in a city like the millennials are now giving up cars to live in the city, you know, that would have been predictable, but I did not predict it. Uh, and we'll come back in, in, in 20 years and take a look at what that is. Uh, so that'd be, that'd be my look. Anybody want to jump in? Can I just add one, one thing? I think it's a very astute and thoughtful question. I, the, my re reflection on it, I'm not sure that there's a precise answer, because I think there's actually a plenitude of answers. And a big part of it is making sure there's room for the plenitude, which means, uh, you, you know, here in the United States is a perfect example. I'm kind of playing a little bit off of your, your generational observation. We spend a great deal of time terrified about what advertisers, corporations, and governments do to track our every movement. And so our conversation is all about opting out of that, right? When it, the ethical frame that you hear in, in the 212 and the 415, that's the dominant dimension of that conversation. When you go outside of that realm, it's just as often about digital inclusion. It's about not being forgotten. It's about the ethical requirement that if I am not on the map, I am not being served. And so there is a, a, an you, we need ethical frames and processes that are 
inclusive, representative, democratic, open, and flexible, and, and willing to be adjusted over time as, as we understand this in a kind of discursive way. And I, I think, you know, I will say Planet, this is not a plug for Planet, but Planet does that in a very deep way. It's one of the most active ethical, is a very, very formal and robust ethics, data ethics uh, uh, board and program, and it's, a, it's an active daily conversation in the hallways all the time um, as, we, as we think about how to roll this out in a way that, that genuinely is beneficial to the world. Andrew, thank you. Frank Prouch, Velocity Tech Partners. Yesterday, uh, <clears throat> A briefing from West Point covered the vertical aspects of the urban area, and I, I, I look at the at the heading that you have, sensing urban change from above. What are we doing on integrating at a systems level on integrating from below? And looking at the subterranean world of geospatial, which I personally think absolutely stinks in every city that I've known. Uh, you have everything from no data to uh, blueprints, to overlays from the 50s, to, um, to modern uh, Google Map stuff, but it still has no credibility. So how do you come up with knowledge by being able to tie together what we love and do, which is all above surface, with where probably more than 60% of a city's actual activity occurs, which is below the surface, and come up with a credible plan to do that? I would challenge that the geospatial community needs to develop a society of tunnel rats that, <laughs> that effectively learns how to deal with urbanization from underneath the ground. I think on top of the tunnel rats, you need the sensors to go with it and the ability to, to collect that data. One of, the, one of the reasons why we don't have all that data is it's so hard. Why is it so hard? Because the GPS doesn't work when you're subsurface. So mapping those environments in a in a denied GPS realm is part of it. Plus, we love UAVs. How about UGVs that map the tunnel? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. We have to get past looking at the tunnel as a part of the urban place. And again, there's there's an interesting two sides of this of this conversation that says we don't agree that it's important, and, and you sort of say, what's the public? public policy part of that, uh, where the here to four cities did infrastructure, and, and increasingly as private infrastructures put in cities, uh, the maintenance of that infrastructure is a much different economic model. And uh, in talking with uh, Autodesk yesterday, as buildings are being built, there's a LIDAR scan of the building every day. So before the walls go up, you understand where all that infrastructure is because of the total cost of ownership understanding. But the bureaucratic changes around that are slower to follow because we'll dig up out in front of this building three times in the same week because three departments can't communicate about their infrastructure. Uh, but that is a solvable problem, and we, the technology, just uh, stand ready to serve, uh, and then you know, we're sort of back to the, the social realization. Uh, we have probably time for maybe one or, or two questions, if somebody would quickly assert. Yeah, Barry. Jeff, I'm actually going to cue off of something you said a couple minutes ago. You were talking about the fact that the public is constantly challenged and influenced by Hollywood's version of the business we do. I'm curious, as technologists, how does Hollywood influence the vision you're taking forward, and how has it affected the process and flow you've taken to get to the point we are right now? I think there's there's so many interesting movies there that really you, you scratch your head and you're like I mean these guys I, someone made the comment this morning we should have a science fiction person in here observing the audience and the things that we have because these guys are constantly thinking about crazy things right and I think that really starts to shape uh, and almost uh, bias some of your thought of what the art of the possible can and potentially could be I know I do that personally and I see my kids doing it when they pick up a you know the little phone. They're like, Dad, what is that? It's connected to a wall. How do I like take pictures and look at movies? You know, it's just like it's amazing what these movies have gotten you to really think about exploring. Can I just say I randomly walk up to people at Planet and I go, Enhance Sexter Four, Zoom, <laughs> Zoom. Yeah. Now look at the reflection off his eyeballs. Mm -hmm. And just randomly to people, yeah. right? <laughs> it's kind of an ongoing, it's an ongoing and so, so they send you to New York. Too. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> so you know, we all look at Minority Report as a way to visualize data and live within the data. Uh, and, and that technology is here now. And I can imagine and have watched 
uh, I've had the opportunity to brief heads of state, and when you present them the right data convincingly, uh, the policy follows, and it's the same whether it's the, any head of an organization, uh, public or private, uh, to when the, the data becomes compelling. And uh, uh, gentlemen, I think you've helped paint a very useful picture uh, for how to make the data more compelling so the geography is even more uh, empowered and interesting. Uh, so thank you.